Well, a lot of dash lights don't phase me much, but this one's a little disturbing. This is a little guy sitting in a seat with a big airbag puffed out in his face and it's red. That's SRS, Supplemental Restraint Systems. And I got an airbag sitting right here and the passenger side. So today on Tech Garage, we're gonna go ahead and address this SRS issue, diagnose it and repair it. Welcome to Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com. Now, we've seen our fair share of dash warning lights. I mean, we've seen check engine lights, we've seen ABS lights, and we've even seen a couple of TPMS, tire pressure monitor lights. But Brian, this one's a little different, man. This is a little guy sitting there with this big airbag popped out in his face. Yeah, that one, the SRS, Supplemental Restraint, and it's red, that's a little bit scary. Yeah, and what that means is airbag something, right? And there is a lot of fear and trepidation around any type of airbag service or repair. The good news is, with the right tools and the right process, we can show folks today how easy this is that just about anybody can tackle this issue. And the right tools is key. I mean, we're talking about a Rock Auto scan tool right here. First step, we got a dash light, we scanned it. I got a U0171. U's interesting. We saw P, powertrain, C for chassis, and we seen body controls with a B, but use a network code. So what that led us to is the loss of communication, which is network, it wants to talk, loss of communication with that right front impact sensor down there. We have an issue with that, that's gonna be a problem. And that code find is absolutely everything. Think about it, there's side curtain airbags, there's rear air airbags these days, there's seat sensors, weight sensors, seat belt sensors, there's so many things that could trip this light in the SRS system that scanning the code and knowing where to begin is everything. It's gonna save us a lot of exploratory surgery, so we're right here. Absolutely, you know, and it's simple. I got a schematic up here on the screen. That's always the first place to go, is to take a look at the system. And this one's pretty simple here. You can see the occupant restraint controller that's located inside the car now step one was to unplug that we want to take away the power from that and we just want a wire harness just sitting there and it goes down here and it feeds this front impact sensor the right one that's located on the actual support of the radiator on the passenger side and then I have both of these connectors so we can see what we're dealing with do the research take a little time make sure you're dealing with the right ones but the cool part Brian is right here there's different tests you can do you know in this test it's specific for this circuit but it works on all the circuits, any circuit. You wanna check for a couple of things. What you wanna check for is short to voltage, short to ground, make sure the wires aren't touching together, short to each other, and then just check continuity from where the sensor lies all the way back to the computer. They're pretty simple, but you know what? We'll even simplify it more. Let's go through each one of them step by step, and we'll start by making sure there's no voltage there. Great, let me get this right front sensor connector off. Here we go, easy to get to. All right. We're set up for volts, that's right. what we need, right? DC volts, I'll switch it over right there, okay. we're in good shape. I'll All go right. ahead and hit one post. All right, you hit one post. Okay, there you go. And I'll go in the other one. Now remember, it's unconnected. So what should we see is zero volts. That's right. a good thing. If we saw voltage with it unconnected, now it's unconnected on this end and that end. Yep. So that means that some wire's feeding it power. And if it's feeding its power, it's That's gonna bad. go ahead and short it out. We're gonna lose communication with that sensor. That's a bad thing. But we're good, because we got zero there. That's a good thing. So the now, voltage test is okay. Next thing we wanna do is we wanna check it across from each other, make sure the wires aren't touching each other. So to do that, we're gonna switch our meter over to ohms of resistance, and we're gonna go in the same two terminals. So if we go in those same two terminals once again, what we're seeing is OL, that's, that's out of limits, that's open. That's yep. a good thing, that's once good. again, on this one, because what's happening is those wires are not touching together. Matter of fact, if you put it back in there, yep. I'll reach over and I'll touch your terminal, yep. and you can actually see ohms of resistance, that would be bad. We don't want them touching, we want them to go completely back to the computer inside of there and not touch each other. Yep. Now another one, what if it's shorted to the frame, short to ground? Yep. Very simple to check. Now these are on any sensors, any circuit. That's the cool part. So you can go ahead and you take that. I'll take the ground. I'm gonna switch over to a clamp right here. Yep. And then you can either go to a battery or find a suitable ground. This car is absolutely perfect because we have a suitable ground right here. We can go ahead and clip it to the ground wire. There you go. And then you're gonna go to the terminal on ohms of resistance. Brian, you got OL, that's yep. a good thing. That's a good thing. Now go to the other terminal. Keep checking, there you go. And OL. Once again, good thing. We're not touching anywhere on the frame. If you did, put it back in there, put yep. your hand on the frame, 
and touch that little terminal you with go. your finger, yep. bam, you see that? Yep. The electrons are running through you, through the meter, yep. and it's looking at them. It's actually getting back. So we don't want those wires touching the frame anywhere. Right. So what that tells us right now is that our circuit integrity is in good shape here, all the way back to the module. We just have to check the wires, and that's the last two right here. We're gonna go from the impact sensor all the way down to the controller inside, and we wanna check continuity from each one. Now, which one? There's a bunch of connectors. Well, 12 and 26. So Brian, you gotta get inside of there, check it out, and we'll see what's going on there. All right. Okay, so which connector do you work on in here to check for continuity? Good question. Remember when you looked in the service manual online and John's diagram said a big yellow connector? Here's another tip. All SRS connectors are yellow. So we've located it in here. Frankly, we probably could have just pulled the ashtray to get to this, but so that you can see what we're doing, we've removed the center console here. So what we're gonna do is back probe this and check for continuity, resistance, up to that connector up front. So John, I think I'm ready. Perfect, you know, that's the connector we had unplugged the whole time. So our wire harness goes from here all the way to that. Brian, we're looking at terminal number one out here and you have to go to 12, that's the same wire. So if you go ahead and put it in 12 down there, we should have some continuity, perfect. All right, so Got you it. had about 0.2 there. And that shows us that there's not a lot of resistance. That's a good thing. So that means that the wire's connected, but there's no corrosion or anything going on. Now, Brian, if we switch over, I'm gonna go to two out here. So if I go to two and you go in there and find 24 is the other one. Got it. And that one's showing 0 0.3, 0 0.2. Perfect, so that Perfect. means we have continuity all the way through the system from here to there, no corrosion, no problems. Now the wire harness is in good shape, the circuit integrity is in good shape, we know it's a sensor. So Brian's gonna go ahead and start working on this sensor, but when we come back from break, you don't wanna miss it. There's more Tech Garage presented by rockauto.com. Make sure you come back because there's gonna be a big bang that goes along with this system. Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com, is being brought to you by Borla, the world's most winning exhaust. Evapo Rust, super safe rust remover. And by rockauto.com, all the parts your car will ever need. Welcome back to Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com. Now, only on Tech Garage are you going to have it laid out on a board. Supplemental restraint system from our friends at ATEC sent the whole system right here. And what Brian was dealing with inside the car was the occupant restraint module. This one's called a sensing diagnostic module, but it's the same thing. That's in the center of the car. You can see it right here. And the interesting thing on this one, there's an arrow that says forward because this thing actually arms with velocity. When the car hits something, there's a little ball that's gonna go forward and it's gonna arm, and that's one of the enable criteria that's gonna allow it for the airbag to go off, but still there's some other things that have to happen. Now right here, this is cool, this is a clock spring, and what a clock spring does, it lets you turn the steering wheel to the right and to the left and keep all the wires in contact, so when you turn, you're not wrapping them up in there. Now you see the wires right here are yellow, now here's a tip for you. If you're dealing with an old school clock spring, they may be indexed. So you wanna make sure you turn the wheel all the way to the right, all the way to the left, get it in the center, do the same for it and then reinstall it. If you don't, you'll turn the wheel, you're gonna hear a click and you're gonna snap it right off. Not that I've ever done that, but it can happen. Now, here's the airbag itself. Now you have a driver's airbag, which is located right here. And I got one right here for you. You can see it right back here. You got your yellow connector right there. And then what you have a nitrogen charge in there that's gonna ignite. And once the igniter ignites, boom, it's gonna blow off. Now passenger, a little bit different. The passenger airbag's located right here. And if I take the cartridge out, you can actually see it right here. This is full of an argon charge, a little bit less of a pop, but it's gonna go ahead and blow that out. That's your passenger airbag right here with the argon charge. Now. In the front of our car, you can see our sensors right here. We had our front impact and our left impact sensors. Now these are the sensors, not so much for impact, but really more for velocity, because what goes on with this whole airbag system, it's pretty interesting. It's called delta V, or it's actually velocity and change in velocity. Delta means change, and velocity is velocity, how fast it happens. You heard of stage one, stage two airbags, all this stuff's pretty cool. Now, we still have the seat belts, we have the occupant seats, we have the weight sensors, we have all kinds of systems going on that have to trigger this. You're not just gonna go out there and pop an airbag. But here's what goes on. Now what I got is I got my Bugatti right here, and then I have my actual McLaren. 
So what happens during a crash or with the airbag system, the SRS, if I hit this actual McLaren with my Bugatti, which I'd never want to do, but if I hit that, it moves, and then as a move, I'm not going to get as much velocity. So what's happening there, the delta V is not very high. So maybe the airbags won't even trigger, maybe just the seatbelt retractor will pull back, or we may go into stage one deployment. Now on the other hand, if I take my Bugatti, Boy, I wish I had a Bugatti I could do this with, and I run smack into the blocks right there, the delta V is very high. The system senses that. Those impact sensors Brian's replacing is gonna sense that, along with the sensing diagnostic module, boom, we're gonna kick that airbag out. Now, I got an airbag right here. You can see it on a column. It's all wired up and it's ready to go. So what I can do is I can step back. Now, you never wanna do this at home, but once all that criteria is met, going down the road, bam, hit that big velocity, no check engine lights, the system has to be active and ready to work. Now once that happens, that airbag's gonna pop out. Now I'm gonna hold on to this. Don't try this at home. So the Bugatti hits the brick wall and then off it goes. Well there it is, I promised you a big bang, you got one. Now let's check in with Brian and see how he's coming along with that impact sensor. What, what, did you say something John? Holy cow, that was an awesome demo. I'm glad I was over at the toolbox for that. But it shows you the amount of power in just one airbag and how hard they're working to save your life if you ever get in a compromising situation. So I've got one bolt out on our old sensor. Go ahead and get the top bolt out here. Just two 10 millimeters, very simple. Again, the real magic on this project is getting the proper diagnosis and understanding exactly what needs replaced. So you remember we have it disconnected? Pull out the bolt. Now, when you pull your sensor out, take note of the orientation. I'm gonna come straight up and out so you can see how it was facing. White side in, connector obviously at the bottom. You wanna reinstall your new connector from rockauto.com the exact same way. I'm gonna pre-connect it here with the harness just to make my life a little bit simpler. It's in, you hear the click and back into the mounting bolt. I'll get both of these studs reinstalled. The final step is to get back in the vehicle, turn the key to the accessory mode, and clear the SRS code, and then ultimately take a test drive. But stay with us. We got more safety information coming up as we tackle brakes on Project M&M, only on Tech Garage, brought to you by rockauto.com. That ought to do it. I got it bled. Welcome back to Tech Garage presented by rockauto.com. Well, if you remember last week, Project M&M Mercury Makeover, it was in the shop because we actually flushed the brake fluid and the power steering fluid. Well, when you flush the brake fluid, it's necessary to bleed it. So we went around to all the wheels and we bled the brakes. Now we're gonna turn our attention to actually the rotors and the pads. And why are we doing that? Well, remember, in the evaluation, you had a pedal pulsation. I was stopping and that pedal was pulsating. Brakes just didn't feel very good. It's really very common. And what happens, there's two terms out there. It's disc thickness variation. That's when the pads are hitting it, and that causes a term called lateral runout. That's when the rotor starts to get warped, and it touches those pads, sends the fluid back to the master cylinder. You feel it in the pedal. A couple checks you can make right out in the driveway. You can get a dial indicator. Professionals do this. They clip it to somewhere, go here, secure the rotor, and spin it around. You don't want any more than three thousandths lateral runout because that's going to push the pads back, and you're going to feel it. Now, another super important measurement you have to make, and that's disc thickness. You have to get rid of the disc if it falls below the minimum thickness specifications. And you just put a micrometer on there, you read it. You can get a nice easy one like I have a digital one. It just reads it right out for you. And then check the specification. You can see the graphic here. There's always a disc thickness specification. If it falls below that minimum specification, you have to get rid of it. It can't trench for heat. That causes brake fade. Your brakes go to the floor, super dangerous. So we're just gonna go ahead and replace the rotor and the pads. We'll go ahead and show you how to do that. It's really simple. I already broke loose the big bolts on the back on the bracket. Now that could be a bear, so I used a half inch drive to do it. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm simply gonna come over here. I'm gonna use an electric ratchet because I already broke it. And I'm gonna pull the two caliper bolts. There's one on the bottom and there's one up on the top here. Now after you get those pulled, 
Sometimes you have to go in there with a screwdriver, pry it back a little bit to give you some play to take the caliper off. We got ours pretty loose here. And then I'm gonna flip it up. You got two options at this point. I'm gonna go ahead and secure it up here. I got a good place. Or I like to use a bungee cord mechanics wire, some way to support that caliper. Why? Well, this hose, you don't want to damage the hose. And once again, that's the fluid transfer that you need to do the stopping. Once I got that done, you can see the pads in the rotor here. Now I can slide the pads out. Under our case, I can just switch over here and I can go ahead and pull the whole bracket off. And once I get the whole bracket pulled off on the back, that'll give us access to the actual rotor assembly. There's two, there's two bolts located in the back here. And like I said, I broke them loose earlier. They're big bolts. And you also need some Loctite when you reassemble it because these bolts have to stay secure. It's the only thing holding your caliper assembly on. So once I get those pulled out, now it's just as simple as moving the whole bracket off. Once I get the whole bracket off, the actual pads are gonna go with it. So you can see I got the brackets right here, the pads. Now the pads aren't even worn out, but you know what? Man, we got pads and rotors. We got Tom back with us from rockauto.com. Tom, this rotor's pretty rusty. I mean, there's a lot of meat on it, 53,000 miles, but that pedal pulsation, it's not worth cutting. You got all kinds of options for us. Now, this is a nice southern car, but in lots of parts of the world where there are road salts uh, creating rust, you'll get a buildup of rust here that'll create jacking, that'll actually push that rotor out and create, contribute to that, that pulsing sensation. At rockauto.com, we have new hardware the uh, bleeder valves, pins that, that can get that corrosion and, and contribute to the, the, the pulsing or uh, squealing if everything isn't lined up right. A, a lot of times in the rustier parts of the world, these will just snap off when you, when you go to, to open them up. I was surprised ours didn't now. We bled ours and I mean, it's been sitting for a while, but like you said, it's from the south. A lot of times that happens to us. They snap off, it's no good. I can't bleed the brake system. So yeah, good idea. So that's separate as well. Really like that Rock Auto carries the separate parts because maybe just perhaps I wanna go in and I wanna sand the brake pads or clean up the brake system, just do a service, maybe not a whole replacement. And you know, the pins start sticking, those are floating calipers, that has to move. If that doesn't move, you're gonna get inboard premature pad wear or the pads are gonna to wear too early, so I can get this all separate. Absolutely, and, and, and it's a good idea when you replace the rotors to always put on new pads. You don't want that squealing. The tolerances stack up and, and you're more likely to get squealing if you don't put new pins, new pads when you put your new rotors on. Now our car, you know, it's pulsating, but it's also been sitting for two years. So we're gonna go ahead and do the front rear. It was pretty inexpensive. What was our choices? This is what's really cool. I mean, I got multiple choices on pads and rotors. Yeah, especially when a car gets to be 10 years old, you just, you have a choice of brands, you have a, a wide choice of prices. So you don't have to worry about wearing your, your pads down to the last millimeter. They're just not that expensive. And we're gonna use the actual Element 3, which is, you know, middle of the road. I mean, we got pads, inexpensive pads. If we wanna put them on here, we can do this job for virtually nothing. I mean, and we're talking about brakes, a safety issue. Right, yeah, you talk about inspecting the brakes, just go ahead and replace the pads. The cost is so low, we got your wheel off. Exactly. Well replace it. I'll tell you what, hand me that rotor. That's a beauty. I got this wiped down so we don't create any lateral run out. Now, what you would do at this point, Tom, it's pretty simple. We'll just reverse the procedure. We'll put everything back together, you know, and then use your torque specifications. That's huge. Also, pump your pedal before you drive the car. We push the calipers back. We'll jump to the rears. We'll get the rears done. I'll meet you over at the table. I think it's really cool that we can show our viewers there's so much going on with pads and brakes. We'll look at it at rockauto.com. That'll be fun. Now, Tom, on the Project m and I was astounded by so many choices when it came to brakes and the pads. Nothing to it. I mean, walk us through that. Yeah, as the cars get older, we get, we get more and more brake choices. We get these wholesaler closeouts that are quality parts, but they're in limited quantities. We pay a lot less for them, so we pass that savings on to customers. So I pulled up an example, the 1997 Nissan Altima. Just look at all these brake choices you have. Starting at less than five bucks. Five Start bucks for a set of brake pads. <laughs> famous brands for yep. less than 10 bucks. Wow. So when you're thinking about inspecting or, or getting down to the last millimeter, don't even yeah. bother, just, just replace them. Absolutely, I mean, we would just sand them down sometimes and insulate the back. We got some brake squeal. For five or $10, I'm gonna throw them on the car. Uh, yep, that makes more sense. Will you get on rockauto.com, get you some brake pads for less than $10, and take a short break, because we'll be right back with more Tech Garage right after this. Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com, is being brought to you by ZMAX, the one product for your engine, transmission, and fuel system. AP Laser, leading the way. 
by rockauto.com. All the parts your car will ever need. Welcome back to Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com. Now it's time for the video question of the week, and it's a pretty common one. It has to do with a window problem. Roll it, maestro. Hey, Brian John, my window seems to be stuck down. I hit the switch. I hear no noise. It seems to be raining the forecast. Can you please help? Common problem, Christian. You got two alternatives. Get an umbrella or get that inside panel off and do some checks. Yeah, and you got two pieces down there. You have a window regulator right here that runs the window up and down. That's one part of the puzzle. Now you also have a motor, so we'll have to check the voltage as well. But really cool, we cut a door panel away so you can see the action inside of here. I'm gonna go ahead and run this up and down. Take a look at that. What you got down there, Brian? Yep, it looks pretty good. Here's a good trick to look for right here. If the window is askew, is not solid in that mount, if it's going up crooked, that's one set of problems. The motor and the electrical is fine. I don't think you have that though. No, so what you want to do is, they're pretty simple. They're bi-directional motors. That's what window motors are. We have one right here, Christian. You can just check voltage going down to it. It's going to be a positive and a negative. Why? Because it's coming up one way positive. It's returning through the switch to ground. And when I switch the polarities, it goes the other way. So it's not really a bad check. Brian, if you would switch that over yep. to volts and hold volts. that up. Yep. I'll unplug this motor right here. Two wires, no problem. I'm going to go across one side. And then I'm going to go across the other side of the terminal. Make sure they don't touch. And then what we can do is we can run the switch. We go in one direction, got a negative 12 volts. You go up in the other direction, you got a positive 12 volts. So what that tells us is you have power going to it. You're probably going to need a window motor, especially if you don't hear anything. Now, if you didn't have voltage and you were in an emergency situation, we can jump this, Brian. You could. You could hit that positive lead and go ahead and get that window back up. Yep. We can take voltage to one side of it and get the other one to ground. It'll go in one direction or try the other side. It'll go in the other direction. Yep. What about our charger, man? That thing's I tell you what, great. the SRS project was a blast. A lot of people have a lot of fear and trepidation around airbag service, but I think we conquered that and that thing's running great. You know, and when you get that airbag light, go ahead and address it because it usually disables the system as well. Yep. You know, hey, follow us on Facebook, Twitter. Twitter and YouTube. We're out of time for today, folks. So stay with us till next week. We're going to be right back here at Tech Garage presented by rockauto.com, where we're always technical, but always understandable. Production assistance for Tech Garage is provided by Chipola College, located in Mariana, Florida. Founded in 1947, Chipola College is a member institution of the Florida College System with a current enrollment of over 2,000 students. Chipola was recently ranked as one of the top three community colleges in the United States. 